my friends, and welcome to part one of The Magic of the Golden Dawn. Now, I'm going to open this one up with a little bit of a disclaimer, and that is to say that this is not a purely traditional approach to the Golden Dawn material. So, if there are any uh, Golden Dawn purists who run across this video and feel the need to inform me of the fact that I'm doing it all wrong, I uh, would save it. If you want to have a detailed discussion about methodologies and uh, share some of your personal insights with me, I'm all about that. But I don't follow cult leaders. So if you're a cult leader or if you're following a cult leader, just don't even waste my time with all of that. Please, do us both a favor. Alright, so... Where does this stuff come from? First off, there's the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was founded in 1888. It was said to be drawn from these uh, cipher manuscripts that were supposedly received from a uh, German order that was a continental, true Rosicrucian ancient deal. Uh, more likely, it was actually recovered from the library of Kenneth Mackenzie, a prominent Freemason who was friends with William Westcott, one of the founders of the Golden Dawn. Uh, fellow named McGregor Mathers greatly enhanced the material. He spent a lot of time in the British Museum and Library did a few translations of old grimoires and really uh, kind of created the classical Golden Dawn initiatory system based on Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, and grimoireic magic. Now, eventually that original order, it lasted for uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 years, 25, and then it splintered into two separate orders and eventually most of those lineages died out. A couple of them may still be alive today. It's debatable, but there are certainly people who seem to have pretty bona fide lineages. However, in the uh, 1970s and 80s, a fellow named Israel Regardi decided to go ahead and publish all of his papers. Uh, he didn't know of any living adepts other than himself at the time. Uh, so he published everything up through Adeptus Minor. And I was first introduced to the Golden Dawn system through a book called Modern Magic. Anyway, here I'm gonna focus on the more or less classical ceremonial magic, the kind of information, instruction, and training that at least in part one of this video would generally fit into a neophyte curriculum. So let's start by talking about Hermetic Initiation or Rosicrucian initiation, what that's all about. And as with so many things in ceremonial magic, it starts with the Tree of Life, okay? So we'll go ahead and sketch it out. We have three spheres that are called the Supernal or Divine Triad. And then we have three spheres which are the Soul Triad. Another three spheres for the Ego or Psychic Triad. Psychic being of the Psyche, not like psychic powers like Professor X. Uh, and then, pendant, of course, we have the material world. And we've got paths connecting all these guys to each other. Alright, so the Tree of Life diagram comes from the Kabbalah. Uh, the way it's approached in ceremonial magic is generally referred to as hermetic Kabbalah, because so much of ceremonial magic traces itself mythologically back to Hermes Trismegistus, an Egyptian god who became Hermes of the Greeks. So we call it hermetic Kabbalah to differentiate from a classic Jewish Kabbalah, which has some very strong similarities. Hermetic Kabbalah was learned by Christians from Jews who incorporated alchemy and astrology, and eventually we have the modern Hermetic Kabbalah, which has been inherited by pagans, atheists, Christians, and many, many, many others. So, it can be seen as a map of the psyche. We have the divine self, which is something that most of us have never experienced any awareness of. Then there's the soul self, which again, most people have never experienced any awareness of. Then there's your ego and your body. Okay, so... From the body to the ego, this is called Yesod, we, it's related to the moon. And then of course we have, what is it, Venus and Mercury. Kind of difficult to remember which side when I'm thinking about the camera. <laughs> and these 
constitute your psyche. There's your energetic awareness, your intellect, uh, well, your central energetic awareness. Then we have your intellect and your emotions. And these kind of form your human frame of reference. And that's very directly tied to the body. I mean, there's, I guess, kind of a mind-body demarcation, but it's kind of, you know, we're already connected. But up here we have the veil of Tiferet, okay? Because this is the soul triad. This is the immortal self. This is a part of you which is unchanging from before this incarnation will remain unchanged after you die. This is the sphere of Tiferet associated with the sun, and then we have Mars and Jupiter on the pillars of severity and mercy alike. Now, a hermetic initiation scheme is based off the tree of life. Uh, the neophyte grade is called zero equals zero because there is no sphere for the neophyte grade. It's more of a learning grade. It's a place where you're introduced to basic intellectual information, the tree of life, the Hebrew alphabet, astrology, alchemical symbolism, uh, some correspondences to the tree of life, like angels, god names, uh, pagan gods, planets, all of that stuff, uh, but a very intellectual education. Um, and then you move to the grade of Zalater at the base of the tree. And this, again, just fleshes out more practice, more practice, more practice. And then you go through three further grades related to the spheres of the Moon, Mercury, and Venus, respectively. These are all the outer order grades. The Sun is where you get the grade Adeptus Minor. This is basically an adept, if you've ever heard of that term. In the hermetic sense, an adept is a human being who, while alive in the flesh, has the awareness of their immortal soul inside them. This veil here, which generally separates soul awareness from egoic awareness, is called the veil of paraket. And the whole goal of hermetic initiation, ceremonial magic initiation, Rosicrucian initiation, all these terms are more or less synonymous with different flavor on them. The goal is to build up your body, mind, emotions, intellect, and bring them all together within a religio-magical discipline that will allow you to permeate the veil of paraket consciously permeated and physically permeated so that the soul world emits itself through your flesh, your emotions, your mind, your words, everything. That is what an adept is, is someone who speaks from the immortal realms. The next two degrees of adepthood, adeptus major and adeptus exemptus, are the grades where you learn magic. Now, down here in the outer order grades, you're learning magic too. It's just a denser magic that's most particularly applied to disciplining your mind, your emotions, and your energy. Energy, energy, energy. That's what the sphere of Yesod is all about. Okay? That's what the uh, practicus grade is all about. It's energy. Throughout all of these, it's energy. You have to master that dense energy and master the basic arts of magic as part of of preparing yourself, the experience of permeating the veil of paraket, and awakening your immortal self. Now, after you've done that, a lot of people, when they permeate paraket and they experience Tiferet for the first time, they think they've reached enlightenment. They think they've become God. They, they think all these crazy things because their psyche has simply never experienced energy like that before. But really, there's a reason it's referred to as Adeptus Minor. It's like you've just hatched from the egg. It's amazing. There's all this light. But you're tender and ignorant. And there's still a heck of a lot to learn. And so the following two grades are the grades where you learn the advanced arts of magic. And part of that is learning to communicate with spirits. Learning to open your senses to different sources of information. Looking to take it beyond what you can learn out of a book and perhaps even beyond what you could learn from a teacher, although the best teachers are more than happy to share this space with you, work together with you, and uh, maybe show you some technical applications 
all of that. Now, Aleister Crowley and his uh, Ordo Templi Orientis and his Argentium Aester were the two orders that he basically, well, one he fathered and the other he inherited and changed. Anyway, they operate on a, the same initiatory schema. Now, he says that Adeptus Minor is about knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. I say he's wrong. I say that the Holy Guardian Angel exists beyond the Abyss. And so, for a self-awakened spiritual being who has undergone significant magical disciplines, now it's time to call out to your guardian angel, which is nothing other than that unique sliver of the true and immortal God which watches you. <laughs> All right. So, let's go back to Neophyte. This is just giving you an idea of what the initiations are all about and what they're leading you to. But let's get into the methodologies. So the training of the neophyte grade involves a lot of things which are now common practice. Um, back in the 1880s, 1890s, these were secrets that were guarded by initiatory oaths. Uh, but those oaths were broken long ago, they spread, this knowledge became common awareness, and other initiatory traditions either shared or had their secrets taken as well. So, to moderners, some of this stuff might seem deceptively simple. A lot of hack New Agers like to take practices that they don't understand the source of origin of, and just spread it about, and something gets lost in the transmission. So I'm going to go over a few of the basic elements of a more or less standard neophyte training regimen and tell you as much as I can in a brief video what it's all about. So one of the first tasks is to begin keeping a dream journal. Now we've all heard lots about dream journaling. Some people out there have even learned astral projection. This is a beginning of the training method not only for astral projection and lucid dreaming but also part of the training method for seership, also part of the training method for prophecy and for magic and for self-development. Uh, a key here to the dream journal thing, uh, the lucid dreaming and the out-of-body stuff aren't generally addressed until the Adeptus Minor grade or near that. Um, the focus on the dream journal really is to start understanding all the hidden elements of your own self. Because we often, we ask ourselves, why is it that I don't already have this enlightened spiritual awareness? Why am I not already in touch with that immortal self? And unconscious elements of your psyche are a big part of the mechanism that locks you into a purely egocentric state of consciousness. Dream work is a way to start looking at the elements of your psyche that you're not looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, sleeping with that journal beside your bed and writing down every time you wake up. Even if all you have to write down is no dream, or can't remember, or feel vaguely wistful, or feel great, or wish I could... Or, if you actually remember details, even better. Write down as much as you can. Don't try to interpret it on the spot. Don't worry about getting some stupid fucking dream dictionary, or going to your local guru and being like, I dreamed of a snake. What does it mean? What's that a sign of? Uh, just don't even look at it like that. Don't even try to analyze it at this point in time until you've collected at least a couple, maybe a few months, maybe even a year worth of dreams. And then rather than looking back at it, hoping to find a sign, look back at it, hoping to understand more deeply a pattern involved in the functioning of your own inherent psychic makeup. That is the reason to keep your dream journal at this point in time. All right, so the next important exercise is scrying with the tarot. Okay, now, the Golden Dawn had a lot of teachings about the tarot. Most hermetic orders do. Uh, they teach how it correlates to the Tree of Life and teach some divinatory practices, teach you how to use them in magic, etc., etc. None of that really matters for this exercise. For this exercise, what you're working on developing is not a memorized system of correspondences. You're not 
working on interpreting the symbology or delving into the history of each card. What you do is you take the cards one by one, usually one a day, and record this in your journal. Okay, keep a magic journal as well as a dream diary. Okay, and every day do one tarot card. Start with the major arcana, then maybe try some of the minor arcana. Find a tarot deck where the minor arcana, the ones that are numbered 1 through 10, have individual pictures and scenes, not 10 wands, but an actual image, a picture, something complex, so that when you use it for your scrying, you actually have something to work with, okay? You're, there's one element of magic that requires absolute focus on one element, an act of magic, but for passive magic, what you need is a receptiveness to a broad range of sensory input, okay? So whatever card you pick for the day, read some correspondences of it, or maybe even write yourself a little verse thing, something very stream of consciousness that you can recite to yourself, and then spend a while staring at the card, just soaking it in. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to interpret it. Don't try to remind yourself what you think it means. Don't do any of that. Just absorb the imagery like you absorbed those words without even stopping to filter them at all. Don't try to do any interpretation. Just soak it in. Let your mind be like a sponge. Let it be absolutely passive with no need of comprehension. Pure absorption. Some people like to touch the card to their third eye at that point in time to try and saturate it in the energy or reach through the image into that reality with their third eye and draw it back to themselves. That's a little more advanced way to do it, but really soak it in and then put everything down and just stop and let yourself imagine something. Don't try to imagine something about the card you looked at. If you were just looking at the magician and you try to imagine what the magician is all about, little scene let's flip through your mind, that stuff, it could be genuine seership, but more likely it's generated by parts of your own mind that desperately want this exercise to work. So they give you some crap. And they want to know it's real, so they analyze it. And it's all ego functions. This is the stuff you need to turn off. You need to let yourself imagine like a child. Empty everything and just imagine something. Whether it's a scene, an image, a voice, whatever it is, write it down for that tarot card in your magical journal. Okay? And no analysis. Just do it day after day, week after week. All these journaling exercises are really important because they start to give you a map of your own self. They start to give you a map of how you are interacting with various energies and what within you is arising in response to those energies. But it's not the sort of thing that you need to nitpick it apart on the spot. It's the sort of thing that you need to let it happen throughout time. You need to let yourself find a groove and a flow with your metaphysical, occult, and magical disciplines rather than Grasping, 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 just let it become part of who you are. Let yourself become the journey and let yourself become the magic. All right? Next exercise. Ah, yes. Here is one that's kind of a bear. It's not part of the classical Golden Dawn material, although a lot of subsequent orders did use this extensively. It is drawn from yoga, specifically the branch of yoga called Raja Yoga or the Royal Yoga. And... Raja Yoga is about learning to control perception. Yeah, there's yoga that starts with the breathing. There's yoga that works through acts of service, karma yoga. Nani Yoga is devotion to a god or gods. Um, Raja Yoga is about mastering perception directly. The first and most difficult part of that is getting your thoughts to shut off. Not just go blank for a little while, but intentionally keep them shut off. From there, you learn how to use them with perfect control, everything going toward a single point. But you start by learning to shut it off. So you get in a real comfortable spot, nice armchair or something, or maybe a couch, but be sitting upright. Don't just take a nap. That defeats the purpose. Get in the most comfortable position you can possibly be in. Set a stopwatch or a clock with something nice and mellow to break the spell and get in your most comfortable position and do not move. Do not 
do anything. Don't twitch, don't itch, don't think, don't speak, don't breathe loudly, look at the same spot on the wall, don't let your eyes wander. No change. Start with five minutes, see if you can work it up to ten. A lot of people experience extreme physical discomfort when they try to do this, and that means you're doing it right. Eventually you break through that, and you achieve a level of mastery, and you have success with this introductory meditative discipline. And from that point on, your intellectual and mental discipline will be dramatically enhanced over whatever it was before. Um, once you have success in this discipline, it always pays to continue to practice, but you're never going to lose that enhancement once you break through it. If you start sweating buckets and it hurts and you want to move so bad that you can't stop yourself, get back to center, zero out your thoughts. Don't think about whether or not you're thinking, bring it back to nothing. It's a pain in the butt, but it is so worth it. All right, so there are a lot more things involved in uh, Golden Dawn curriculum. I urge you to get Israel Regardi's book, The Golden Dawn, or uh, who is it? Chick and Sandra Tabitha Cicero. Uh, they were students of Israel Regardi's, and they've put out a two-parter. I can't remember the name of it, but it basically takes the same material and breaks it down into easy lessons. It's a good thing to get into if you want to really delve into the Golden Dawn tradition. Um, I tend to favor a much more eclectic approach, obviously. There is one more exercise I'd like to introduce you to before we wrap up this video, and that is called the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram. Now, it's a Lesser Banishing Ritual because there is a Supreme Ritual as well. There's a lesser and supreme ritual of the pentagram, invoking and banishing, and you can even divvy it up by element to invoke and banish specific elements to create influxes of particular energy or to completely empty your life of that energy and start just gaining control and taking notes on how you're affected by different things and start to master the four elements through ritual. But the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram is kind of its own special thing because you do it for all four elements, even though you're using uh, banishing earth pentagram the whole time, because you're banishing on the low level, the dense astral level, you're just clearing out the energy, and then you're drawing in divine and angelic energy. Um, this ritual combines verbalization, visualization, physical action, and uh, energy, if you can master it, but even if you're not controlling the energy, the other three are what start to awaken the ability to control the energy. Okay, And there are other functions of the Lesser Banishing Ritual, the pentagram where you make a cross throughout you and a sphere surrounding you of energy, connecting you to multiple different powers. Um, if you establish that within your aura, it'll open up a whole lot of other training methods and magical methods that are rightly in the whole adept level of magic, okay? So this cross and circle ritual is relatively old. It is part of the original Cypher manuscript. It's been uh, changed and adapted over time. There are various versions of it. I'm gonna go ahead and give you the basic version of it here. And uh, there's also a written copy of this on my website, indigospeaker.com, in the articles section, okay? Anyway, you start by assuming God size. You visualize yourself getting huge. Everything around you, the building you're in, just kind of melting away like a mirage, and you grow huge, huge, huge until the earth is tiny beneath your feet. Then you visualize a star high above your head, an infinity bright radiating star. And for some reason, when you reach up, you can totally touch it and grab some of that light and draw it down like taffy into your forehead. And there you say, Ate. From your forehead, you project it down into infinity. And you say, ah, Malkuth. Ugh, my writing is awful when it's sideways. Okay? So... What it looks like is just Ate Malkuth. Then you bring your attention back to your heart center, okay? 
this was up in your forehead, third eye. Okay? From your heart center, you're going to project off beams of energy into infinity. To the right, you're going to say Vigbura. And then to the left, you're going to say Vigdula. So it's Ate Malkuth. Vigbra, Vigdula. And then you come to the center again. Hold your hands in kind of a prayerful position, close to your heart. And you say Leolam, Amen. Now, some people do it where they just expand it in kind of a spiraling, almost two-dimensional energy. Others will do it three-dimensional, projecting in front of and behind into infinity. So, Ate Malkuth, Vigbara, Vigdula, Leolam, Amen. What does all that mean? It's the last phrase out of the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen, interestingly enough, roughly translates to the Lord is a faithful king. Now, why would we say this Christian thing when so many of us are not Christian? Let's go back to the Tree of Life for a second and ask, who is this thine? Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Who is thy? That, who are we talking about? What we're talking about is our own God self, which is totally separate from you at this point in time. Guarantee it. Um, if you have a body and you're able to move it around and think and talk, your God self is not you right now. Get over yourself. Uh, thine. What you're doing, you are a faithful king. My Lord is a faithful king. My holy guardian angel, my shred of the ultimate creator, is a faithful king. What this is doing is establishing within your psyche a trust in your own divine guidance. Okay? So, when we're doing this cross ritual, where we're drawing this light from this mystic star above us and drawing it into our body and through our body and down into the ground and radiating it out into the universe, we're saying, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And you are a faithful king, is what that means. Okay? You're talking to the highest God that your soul knows directly because your soul is but a reflection of it. So that's what that's about. And then we get into the casting of the circle proper. And let's see if we can show how these pentagrams are made. We'll usually start off in the east and we'll trace up, down, left, right, back down. A banishing earth pentagram. You want to visualize this in blue fire. I like to visualize it starting off about that big, and then when I speak the God name through it, it kind of shoots out and expands until the two feet rest on the ground, and the peak is high above me, and the whole thing's kind of wrapping around, filling that quarter of the circle. Um, so you trace these pentagrams in blue fire, and then you speak or vibrate God names through them, which are kind of like recipes for various forms of divine power. Uh, you'll start in the east, then south, then west, then north, then back to the east. The traditional god names are yod heh vav -He, which is the ultimate god name. Adonai, which simply means Lord. Eheye, I am. And Agala, which is another acronym. Atagibur leolam Adonai. Uh, you are... Uh, justify. Uh, da, da, da. Thou art justice forever. You are justified forever, Lord. Okay. Anyway, if people are interested in this ritual, I can do something that slows it down a little bit and gives you a lot more detail. Right now, we just want to focus on the visuals, okay? So we trace these pentagrams. We vibrate these God names through them. The traditional mode of vibration... You vibrate up in the mask, so it'd be like, Adonai, and you feel it vibrate in your forehead and you radiate the actual sound out. I don't do it that way anymore. I prefer to let it come from my throat chakra. 
law. Okay? So, we go, yod he vav he blue pentagram of fire. Then we trace a white line of fire around at the heart level. Another one. Adonai. Another line of fire to the west. Another blue banishing pentagram. Eheye. And then to the north. Another one. Agala. Okay? Then you come to the center. And it's time to invoke the archangels. You kind of hold it. Some people do like a really rigid cross. I like to just raise my hands because I'm like calling out to these immense divine beings. And you say before me, Raphael, or Raphael, if you want to do it the traditional way. I like to do it with a little emphasis. Before me, Raphael. Behind me, Gabriel. At my right hand, Michael. At my left hand, Oriel. For about me flame the pentagrams, and within me shines the six-rayed star. While you're doing this, you're letting these angelic presences come up to you. Uh, if you're not in that deeper energy level, just go ahead and visualize. Visualize Raphael as this tall, blonde youth with golden, yellow, and violet robes who's a healer. Visualize Michael as this rough, tan guy wearing like a legion, legionary uniform, crimson, maybe with some green highlights, fire. Gabriel, older, perhaps of eastern descent, wearing blue, and orange, like goldfish in the sea, okay? And Oriel, black and white, old, old, old father death, perhaps with a sheaf of wheat, or a sickle. Okay? So just visualize them standing so tall they tower above you, facing inward toward you if they're pouring their wisdom upon you, facing outward if they're protecting you from things outside yourself. And then the that last bit is just to re-strengthen your circle and the six rayed star going out in four directions before and behind you in your heart chakra. For about me flame the pentagrams within me shines the six rayed star. And then you repeat the Kabbalistic cross. Ate, Malkuth, Vigbara, Vigdula, Leolam, Amen. That is the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. At that point in time, rather than getting rid of these energy structures, try to see them all around you simultaneously. Okay? The cross, the circle, the stars, the angels, and then just let them fade from your awareness. Still there, just let them fade and go about your life. Traditionally, you would want to do that morning and night every day for a year. And you record that in your magical journal as well with your dreams and your tarot exercises, as well as perhaps any musings you have on the intellectual material you're studying. So, if anyone would like to, Go ahead and stand up at your computer right now. Go ahead. Don't. I, I mean, if there are people around, I guess you can just try to do it, visualize it and do it with me in your mind. But uh, if you're just, just stand up and do it with me. All right. Get calm, peaceful, centered. Visualize yourself growing. Growing huge, growing bigger than your body, bigger than the ceiling, bigger than your town, bigger than your continent, bigger than the earth, bigger than the solar system until it's all tiny beneath you. And see that infinite star up above. Reach up into it and draw the light down into your forehead like a string of taffy. Ate. Draw the light down into infinity. Malkuth. Draw it out to the right from your heart. Vigbura. Draw it out to the left into infinity. Vigdula. Bring your awareness to the center and let your light shine before you and behind you into infinity. Leolam. Amen. 
facing the east. Yod he vav he. Circle of fire. Adonai. Hold the pentagrams in your mind. Don't let them fade. Continue the circle to the south, to the west now. Draw your next pentagram. A -he -ye. Continue the circle. Another pentagram. Agala. Complete the circle. speak after me, before me, Raphael, behind me, Gabriel, at my right hand, Michael, at my left hand, Oriel, for about me flame the pentagrams, and within me sh six-rayed star. Ate Malkuth Vigbura Vigdula Leolam Amen. And that concludes part one of the Golden Dawn style ceremonial magic training series. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, IndigoSpeaker.com has a little blog on it under articles. You will find a written copy of that ritual there. In any case, my friends, many blessings, best of luck. Any questions you have, leave them in the comments section. The more interest you show, the more of these videos I shall make for you. <laughs> Hail and farewell. <laughs>